Um, hopefully I'm in the right place. All right, so uh, I rejiggered some things. We were supposed to be talking about a, like kind of an example from history of a data scientist and the work they had done. Um, but I realized that I wanted to make sure I covered uh, all the stuff you might need for the project um, you know, with some kind of advanced warning. And there were a few things we hadn't really covered yet as if you've gotten past say question 12, you have discovered. Um, so here goes nothing. Uh, Checkpoint is not due today, it was due last Thursday. Um, I thought I fixed this, but I guess not. Um, so it is due this Thursday, uh, not next Thursday, but it's due the sixth, which is two days from now, end of the day. Uh, however, keep in mind next Monday is a holiday and Tuesday operates on a Monday schedule. So there's no lecture next Monday or next Tuesday rather, or Monday for that matter. All right, everybody here? All right, so we have a question. So when you're building a function, what do you start with? What's the first keyword that indicates it's a function? Oh, actually, while you're filling that out, one more thing. Um, I've been hearing some reports about groups and project in particular, where kind of one person or two people out of the group are doing it without the others. All right, this is not the point of a group. The point of a group is to learn to work together. Okay, so please work with your groups. Do not work independently. All right, as much as you possibly can. That way you can kind of learn from each other instead of having to ask lots and lots of questions on Piazza or of course assistants or TAs or me. Um, instead, you can hopefully collaborate and work together and teach each other stuff, right? One person might be able to figure out something that another person can't. Uh, so please try to work as groups uh, as much as possible. All right. One of these days I'll figure out a way to do a test or something that requires proving that you are working as a group. I don't know how to do it yet though. All right, that was it for the answers. And the correct answer, why is this always like one tab behind what I think it is? Correct answer is death. Okay, and as one of the students uh, found out today, um, when you're creating a function, okay, it's just like any other name. So it's as if you're naming any other variable. So if you call a variable A, right, and assign it to a two, okay, that means that A from then on is a two, right? If you have a function name and you reassign that to be equal to two, it's not going to be a function anymore. Does that make sense? So if I say, you know, if I have a function that I created actually from the project, there's one that's called like first or firsts or something like that. Um, and if I later say first equals two, first is going to stop working. Does that make sense? So it's not actually any special. Okay. If it is a built in function to Python, it will usually warn you or error, but not always. So if it's like coming from NumPy, you can reassign it, okay? So just keep that in mind. They are just like other normal, regular old variables, and you can make them not do what they were supposed to do anymore. If you manage to do that, all you have to do is kind of like reset the kernel and go back to the beginning, get rid of that change, and it'll go back to normal, okay? But yes, it took me a long time to figure out what the error was in that particular block of code. All right, so the answer is def. So you define a function with def because def is shorter than defined. So that's why we write that. All right, multi-param and apply. So multiple parameters, um, this one I think is kind of obvious because you've used them already. But if you're creating a function and you wanna have more than one parameter to that function, that is totally fine, okay? You can have literally as many as you want. Uh, so as a result, you can just keep adding things separated by commas in the function definition, and you will have as many as you like. Um, and then the apply method, okay, which again, you might've encountered during the project, uh, but what this does is applies a, a particular method to every row, okay? So you basically pass it a row or a column and you, and you pass it a method and it'll apply it to everyone. So there's a couple of weird things about that. Um, so 
let's say you pass that the it'll pass each value from the reference column as a parameter to the method. So in other words, like when you have parameters in your method, it's just going to fill it in from the set of of that column for each one, right? It's going to run it for each one, um, but it's going to pass it all kind of as a block. Okay, so it's going to pass it as an array. So for example, that's why you can pass max, for example, to the apply function. It works in a very similar way to group, okay? In that you can just kind of apply the whole function. Now, the part of the reason I brought up the function question uh, a minute ago of like you can reassign a function is when you're passing a function to a method like group or a method like apply, you don't pass with the, the parens, you just pass the literal name of the function. You're passing it around like it's a variable because that's what it is, right? Except in this case, the variable isn't equal to like a number or a letter or you know string or whatever. It's actually equal to the definition of the function. So when you pass it, you pass it as if it was a variable. The parentheses are really just a shorthand for pass the things between the parentheses to the function. Okay, does that make sense? Kinda. We'll show you an example. Make it a little more easy or a little simpler, hopefully. All right. There's that one, and then this one. Um, all right. So here's just a simple example of multiple arguments. So if you wanted to calculate the hypotenuse, okay, it is uh, h is equal to uh, the square root of x squared plus y squared. So as an exercise for the reader, um, could you all try to fill this in on your fancy, fancy notebooks that you have prepared and have running and pulled out of materials. Um, so from here on out, like I kind of said before, is I'll try to give you more of the structure that I think you already know. All right. And I'll usually indicate where you put content with three question marks. Uh, I try to also use the ellipsis. Or I try to use the ellipsis, but it doesn't actually select as well for me. So I, uh, I use the question marks in when we're doing the live stuff. All right. Does anybody have an answer? Like that. Oops, so put up mistakes. Uh, it won't be the same because, oh, oh, I see. You didn't raise it to the power. You just did. Yeah, that's fine. Um, so I'm just doing the square, but I'm using the square you use just because it's only two. You just multiply it against itself, which is fine. Um, and then you return the square root. So we're just going to say part. And then we're going to raise that to 0 0.5, right? OK, and so now we can run it and see if we actually get a value. And you know what? I just realized this. I think I forgot to clear the results, which is kind of annoying. Um, but I'll clear it for me. Um, actually, I'm going to clear them all. And if you want to be able to follow along a little bit better, I would recommend you also clear them all, although apparently I forgot before I saved it. Um, which is one of the things that I really hate about notebooks. I wish it would like you could kind of, it would prompt you or something when you're saving it. Um, so we're going to run it and theoretically we will get the right answer. And that looks pretty good. Okay. And then we get uglier answers when we put in ugly values. All right. So then moving on to the apply function. Uh, this first thing all it's going to do is create a table uh, just to kind of work with. Um, and I don't know, does anybody recognize who the characters are from? All right. Uh, not a fan, personally, um, but I know a lot of people are. So, all right, so that's not going to work. So, what we're going to do is let's only get um, the people who, uh, what is it? Oh, birth year. Yeah, I was like, um, who were born after 1980. No, sorry. Before 1980. So that's what cap at means, which I should know, but I can't find my mouse. There we go. All right. So how would we do that? It's pretty straightforward, but we can use min 
oops, in uh, X and 1980. And so that's going to tell us whether it's below or above 1980, right? In other words, we're going to get, if we pass in a number into that, it's going to tell us if it, it's going to tell us the actual number if it's below 1980, and it's going to tell us 1980 if it's after that, right? Does that make sense? So then we always like to test things to make sure they work. Uh, I have to run it first though. And then, so we know, so we usually like to test both sides, right? So we want to test 19, uh, 1975 because it's on one side of 1980 and 1991 because it's on the other side. All right, and so that seems to be working correctly. We're, we're just going to make it so that everyone's birth year is before 1980, whether they are or not. So this is how we can use the apply function. We take the table, okay? And we call the method apply. We tell it what method we want to use and what column we want to use it on. Okay, so as you can see, this is kind of a stupid example, but you know, so anyone who was born after 1980 gets a 1980 for their birth year uh, and off we go. So that's a really simple one. This one's slightly more interesting. So. What if we want to do, um, we want to print the name and age of the person uh, when they pass in the name and the uh, birth year. So what we do is, anybody guess? How do we figure out the age of someone if we have their birth year? Say that one more time. Current year from the birth year, yeah. Um, so current year is still 2022 minus year, and then we get our age. And now I already kind of wrote the part about uh, printing the name and the age. Um, and so if we execute that, now we can do something a little bit nicer, which it, or a little bit more interesting, right? Is now we can actually get kind of this string back, but we can pass in two data elements to match up to the parameters. Okay, it's just ordered. There's no way, you know, like we've done like descending equals true. There's no particularly good way to do that here. You just have to pass each column in the order you want them to go into the apply, the function that you're passing to the apply. Yeah. Oh, it's in, it's usually under edit clear all outputs, but if you're on, the problem is lab and notebook use two different UIs. Um, so it's up in the menu bar. Oh, okay. So sell all output. All right. Uh, hopefully, actually on Zoom, uh, can somebody indicate if they have sound? Because that would be awesome. Um, just in the chat. Uh, the fact that there's a chat message probably indicates that there's sound. Oh. All right, cool. Um, Moving on, let's go back to the slides. Like I said, I know this is a little fast today, um, but all of this is actually really well covered in the um, uh, textbook. So definitely look there too, if you want kind of a second pass at the same thing. But I have to be on the right window for this to work. And let me just pull this window. All right, so. Um, as you have already experienced, right, is you can group by a single column, okay? So the first argument is which column to group by, and then the second argument, which is optional, um, you can pass in a method, okay? Some useful ones that you probably will see or use a lot are len, which is the length of the, you know, like how many of them there are, um, the list, which is a list of all group values, um, and then the sum, which is a total of all group values. So the len is what you get by default, okay? It comes up as a column that by default is called count, but it's just using the len function on the inside. It's as if you had passed len. Um, but then anything else you want is perfectly valid, okay? As long as it takes the right parameters, right? As long as it takes the, the right kind of data, which is an array of the group's uh, values, okay? So if you pass something, for example, if you pass um, a function, that, I don't know, let's just say it does a sum inside and you try to sum a bunch of strings, that's not gonna work very well, right? So instead, you just need to make sure that the column that it's gonna receive is gonna have data that it can handle. Does that make sense? Okay, it will not receive the count, it will not receive the 
um, column, the group by column, it'll receive all the rest of the columns. All right, and we'll just do a little demo of that. Uh, okay, and we're going to use, uh, I think we've talked about the ice cream cone table before. It is brilliantly awesome. Um, and so we have some strawberry and some chocolate ice creams and various prices. So we can group them by flavor, right? And we can do the default. And that way we see there's one bubblegum style or price or style or whatever. And there's three different chocolates and there's two strawberries. Okay. Um, where's the other strawberry? Oh, okay. So if you notice, both the strawberries are both pink. Um, however, they have different prices. That's why they end up as two items. Um, whereas the chocolates have different uh, colors somewhat, as well as different prices. So that's going to give you, that's why you're getting a count of three, right? If it will completely match, it should collapse it such that um, you'll only get one of them if there's no differences in the row. I think that's how that works. All right. So. Um, let's say instead we want to find out what the average price of the ice creams are, okay, uh, by flavor, okay? So how would I go about that? If you notice, I, it's actually two steps. So think about why it would be two steps if what I wanna do is an average. So maybe fill in the, where do I put, where do I put the average function first? Any ideas? Does it go here, here, or here? Or tell me any other part you think that would be appropriate. This is one of those things where it's hard for me to know which way you would think about it first. Ideas? The third one? Yeah. So this is going to be that we want to take the average, right, of the flavors. So we know that. Okay. And so what we want to do is we want to group it by flavor, right? Ah. However, what do I want to do to the color column? Why is there a question marks there? Why? It'll mess it up potentially with the group if I want to know just by flavor. But there's another problem too. Well, yeah, another problem as well. What's the average of chocolate and chocolate? So that, that's the other reason. You want to drop it so you don't like, mess that up. Um, Oh, sorry, or brown and brown, my bad. If my example wasn't great. So we're just gonna drop, still gonna figure out a different character set that I can select better. So this will give us the average of all those flavors disregarding what individual color they are, all right? And then if I wanna do um, kind of the cheapest, I basically do the same thing, except I'm just gonna use a slightly different function. So I'm gonna do drop and then I'm gonna group and then I'm gonna use min instead. And just notice that I don't put in parentheses, I just am passing the name of the function, okay? And then that should give us the cheapest version of bubble gum, chocolate, and strawberry. Make sense? Okay, like I said, I think this stuff's pretty straightforward. Um, but what I also wanted to show you was something that's a little bit more sophisticated. Uh, for one thing, I got some fixes from the last time I played around with this. Um, so first thing we're going to do is load that uh, survey data that we did the last time. Um, and what if we want to, um, oh, I guess it does just ignore it. Never mind. So what I want to do is I want to see the averages by uh, Python skill. Okay. So in order to do that, I can just group by. and then do an average. And so now I can see a nice table of, okay, so people who have uh, low, low previous experience with Python, um, on average, have a one, you know, almost a one and a half um, score on programming. Uh, they average about 10 text E's, right? People they text and average about seven hours of sleep. On the high end, oh, actually no, on the high end, uh, 
4.8. So they tend to be, if they have a lot of Python, they tend to have a lot of programming, stands a reason. Um, they have a smaller number of techies, so they're less friends. <laughs> uh, or maybe better friends. It's a smaller number, but better. Uh, but they sleep slightly more. So this one, I don't believe. Uh, every every heavy duty programmer I've ever met hardly sleeps. Um, all right, does anybody know what NAN means? You'll see this in programming a lot because it's shorthand. Guesses? Think about why it's called out. Let me know what the choices were were one through five. Stuff outside of the data set. Yeah, so stuff outside of the data set, or and I think somebody over here said it, but it's short for not a number. Okay. Uh, you see this actually in mathematics a lot too, but it'll be usually capitalized. In programming, you'll see it mixed. It'll be lowercase or uppercase. Uh, there's some language that does capital N, lower A, capital N, but they all mean the same thing. Okay. So the important thing about not a number is that it doesn't tell you anything about it. Okay. That doesn't mean it's characters. Okay. It just means that it can't figure out what, what it is. Okay. So just keep that in mind is that it's not in mathematics. It's actually very specific what it means where like you try to divide by zero, for example, that's not a number. It's just not possible. Whereas this, is uh, even broader than that in that you don't you just kind of don't know what it is. Do you have a question? So the proof is taking a whole Python tree, the Python column and then averaging only the Python comment or no so it's taking the Python column um, and and assuming that it's going to group all of those elements or all the rows that have a Python value of one. Okay so it's going to put all those in a group together and then it's going to average every other column. Okay. When a group, when the group function is presented with something that is like strings that can't be averaged, it will normally um, uh, just blank. It'll just be blank. Okay. The only exception to that is this case where the actual Python column had something that was weird. Okay. So, but in general, it does a nice job of just kind of hiding them, right? It just ignores them. Okay. All right. Any other questions? All right, let's move on. So then I'm going to get rid of a bunch of things that aren't numbers, okay, by just dropping those columns. Um, and we get a slightly nicer version of just doing kind of the same thing. And for the vast majority of cases, this is the way I would recommend you do it, is drop the things that don't make sense and then do something like the average. And now that's a much more consumable table, right? Uh, the other thing that you probably should do is go figure out why these are showing up, okay? Um, and make sure that they're legitimately broken. All right, so then the next thing we're gonna look at is we can group, actually, we're just gonna group by average again. Sorry, I thought I, I, thought I switched functions here. Average. All right, except I went back to the ugly table because I wanted to show you another way of kind of doing the same thing. So when I select this way, right, I can just say, give me these columns by number, okay? Because what I want to do is I want to throw them on a graph. I don't want to modify my original table, uh, but I want to be able to see all of them together. Um, <laughs> And I don't know what this really tells us, but you know, it, it, it's a way of plotting it. I just wanted to show you kind of a different technique to kind of approach the same kind of problem. I could also have done that off of the, whatever I call it, survey skills table. Um, and then the last one, let's see what I was gonna show here. Um, oh, right, so, wait, why do I have this? Oh, this is exactly the same thing. Sorry. Um, never mind. So going back to the slides. Uh, okay. So here we have a question. Okay. And mostly because these are the most common ones, that's why there's a little question for it. Or at least in, in this class, they're definitely the most common. Oh, 
All right, final answers. All right. Moving on. And so pretty good. So uh, the len is the number, um, list is a list of all group values, and the sum is the total of the values. All right. So now we will talk about lists. And So lists are just very, very similar to an array, um, except for one kind of key difference. Um, and when I say array, I mean the array we've been talking about in this class, which is a very specific uh, kind of definition. Um, so a list is kind of a broader version of, of something like an array. So what it is, is that you can start it with a square bracket, okay? and then add some stuff to it, okay? Um, and not screw up your casing or your uh, friends and stuff, okay? So I started with a square bracket, very important that it's a square bracket, okay? So these uh, square brackets, angle brackets, and squiggly brackets all have very different meanings um, in programming in general and in Python in particular. Um, as you might imagine, right, there's there's all these opportunities or like we want to write as a programmer, we want to write as few characters as possible, right? So as a result, almost every key on a typical US keyboard is in use somehow, okay? So just kind of keep that in mind, you will, and so it's, it's important to pay attention to the characters that you might normally gloss over. Okay, because a squiggly bracket means something different from a square versus an angle, uh, and they all have names, right? Um, I would say 50% of programmers don't know the names, and they'll just kind of have nicknames for them. Um, so that's my honor, squiggly bracket is the real name of the bracket that looks like a squiggly. Um, but this is called the square bracket, angle bracket. You may have uh, heard of it as uh, crocodile's mouth, right, uh, from way back. Um, but so just kind of keep in mind, all the characters mean something. Um, another really common one that I tried to get a second grade teacher to introduce is, does anybody know what a bang is? What character a bang is? It's exactly what it sounds like. Think about it. What, what letter on the US keyboard would mean bang? Exclamation point, right on. So an exclamation point is usually referred to as a bang because exclamation point is far too many syllables to say out loud. All right, so uh, most characters mean something, so just keep it in mind, pay attention to what character you're typing or using or what I'm displaying, because it will make a difference. All right, so moving on. Uh, does anybody know what an intero bang is? That one's really out there. Yeah, so, so you'll see it in uh, texting a lot, right? Where you say uh, question mark, bang, question mark, bang. Um, that's an intero bang that actually has a, a legit name too, but it's just two of them. Um, and there is actually a key for, like you can actually type it as a character where you only type one character and get both of those letter looking things. All right, too much digression. All right, one, five, hello. Uh, whoops. Um, and then I can do my 5.0 again, but then I can also do something like make array and actually make another array inside the array, okay? Uh, whoever did, anybody ever do like matrices in school? I don't know, matrices a little bit, all right? So in, in programming land, we tend to call that a 2D array, okay? So an array in two dimensions. So all of these tables, for example, are kind of like 2D arrays and 2D just means an X and a Y, right? But you can easily imagine, right? You can have a 3D array, a 4D array. Um, and so it can kind of go ad infinitum. It gets very confusing out there. Also, you can't make pictures out of it, um, but do keep in mind, right? The, the number of dimensions is unlimited, right? I could just make another array right here, 
right? And then I'd have a 3D array. That makes sense? And we usually just refer to them in terms of dimensions to make it a little easier to talk about them. Uh, it doesn't really make them any easier to picture, okay? So going back to the slides and uh, I feel like this is um, weirdly out of order, but it's really not. Um, not the dim sum place. Um, but so here's kind of the formal definition for a list. A list is a generic sequence. Uh, so you can have list of values um, and the values can have different types, but the arrays that we use in this class only can be of one type, right? That's what make, make array enforces. And that's partially why if you've done any Python before, we don't use other kinds of arrays because then it gets messy about lists versus arrays. Um, and you can literally put anything you want in them, okay? So obviously the, the weirder the thing is, the more confusing it will be for anybody trying to look at it later. Um, lists can be used to create table rows, okay? As distinct from columns, which are done with an array, right? Um, and if you create a table column from a list, it will be converted to an array automatically. Okay, so you can have a list, right? That has all the same type in it and you can use that to create a column. But if you try to do that with, um, you know, mixed types, it's gonna get angry. All right, oh, I forgot this is a build slide. And uh, so just like everything else it is zero based, okay? And then we move on. All right, so what's the position of the first item in a list? This should be super easy. All right, closing. And most of you got it correct. It is zero based, okay? Like pretty much everything else we've been talking about, uh, the first position will be zero, but the count will be the number of things, which will be kind of one more than the length or the same as the length, but yeah. Uh, not to my knowledge, yeah. I don't know that there is anything in Python that's not zero based. Other programming languages do have much more mixed, uh, and so that can be entertaining. There's some language I can't think of that actually lets you set what the base is, which is just wrong on many levels. All right. Uh, all right, so why did I go through that? Because I wanted to show grouping by multiple columns. And off we go. So let's say we have our survey table and this, I think we already loaded, but just kind of a reset to make sure um, it didn't get mucked up. Um, so let's say I want to know which way, like how people sleep who are left-handed versus how people sleep who are right-handed, okay? So how would I do that? All right, and the options are obviously for handedness are left and right. Uh, and uh, for the side that they sleep on, it is, uh, let's see, left side, back, right side, stomach. So how would I get, how would I find out whether most people sleep, who are right-handed sleep on their left side uh, versus right side versus back or whatever? What do you think? And it's right there in the name. Come on, somebody's got to have an idea. Apparently, we need like a coffee truck or something at the door. I can use a coffee truck. All right, come on, ideas? So I want to know how would I how would I see who has the most of the uh, left-handed and sleep side? So are left-handed people more likely to sleep on their left? side and right-handed people more likely to sleep on their right side how would i how would i find out that kind of information what would be a way to do it do you have an idea 
You don't need to calculate anything. Uh, close. Um, I'm going to do it even easier than that, which is that I can pass a list, hence they have to teach you lists before I can show you this, um, of columns. And I can say sleep side, right? And so now what I did was I made a list of column names and I passed that to group. And the show, I should have probably left it off because it's kind of like takes you down the wrong path. You don't need to do anything with the show except for use it. Um, and just ignore that. Uh, I don't, just It's a warning about something's going to uh, disappear eventually. Um, and I forgot to put in the line of code that'll suppress it. Um, but so now I can see that left-handed people more likely to sleep on their stomach and right-handed people are more likely to sleep on their left side. Okay, so it might be nicer if I had ordered it, right? If I had sorted it, um, but that is clearly important to somebody who is not me. <clears throat> yeah, so it has to be, that's why I had to do lists first, right? Is because this method only takes two arguments, right? It takes the columns and it takes the method that you want to run on it. In this case, <clears throat> I'm using an implied count, right? Um, or implied length. So actually, maybe it'd be a little clearer if I did it like this. Uh, that's so. Wait, why? Oh, that's interesting. I would have expected to give me the same result, but it's um, <laughs> when I when I do it, it's it's implying a drop of the other columns. Um, so whatever, long story short, I'm just counting up uh, how many, you know, grouping first by handedness, actually, yeah, actually, no, I'm grouping first by handedness, then by sleep side, but I could have as many as I want. That way, the first argument can still be um, the first argument. It could be only one argument, right? Because if I tried to say column, 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 then method, right? The problem with that would be, I wouldn't know how many columns somebody wants to use, right? I'd have to set some limit and then make the last one the method because you can't have a default unless it's after the requires, right? If you think about it, it kind of makes sense, right? Because like doing something like this would look super weird, right? If I wanted to use a default, uh, like if it was the first thing, if the method was the first or the argument was the first thing, like len or sum or whatever, I would have to do something like this if I wanted to use the default. So to get around that, they say, give me a list or a single column name. And that way you can do both. You can get the nice feature of implying the count as well as allowing you to have an arbitrary number of columns. Follow me? All right. You are unlikely to have to build any methods like that, but that's what's going on. All right. So going back to the slides. Uh, yeah. It's because group only takes two arguments. So one of the arguments though can be almost like it's multiple arguments in that you can pass in a list of column names. That makes sense? Okay. All right, moving on. So in kind of, you know, written down the same thing, right? First argument is a list of which columns to group by. So that list can be just one and then you don't have to actually make it a list uh, or it can be multiple, but it has to be a list. You can also do it as a name, right? So you can actually name it as in a variable first and pass that in. That's particularly useful if you don't, for some reason, want to actually drop the columns, but you want to do a lot of operations on a table with just a certain set of columns. That can be a really handy little tool. So second argument is optional and it's how to combine the values. So it might be a method that is built in or provided by NumPy or whatever, or one you wrote. Okay, And I can tell you right now that the project does require you to pass in your own um, method that you wrote 
or that was given to you uh, as the second argument that is not a standard one like some. All right, so um, I think this is an important thing to remember. Maybe everyone else thinks this is obvious, but you use arrays for columns and lists for rows. Okay. And we have another question. All right, so how many arguments can the group method take? I think I beat this to death. There's a horse somewhere. <clears throat> All right, so this one's a little tricky, but the reason it's tricky is because I want you to notice that it's tricky. All right, get those last answers in. All right, so the correct answer is two. Can anybody say why the first answer is incorrect? Anybody else? All right, how about you over there? Right on. Yeah, exactly. So the group method only takes two arguments. One of those arguments can be a bunch of stuff. That doesn't change the number of arguments that the group method takes. Okay. So you'll see this uh, like technique, this mechanism a lot. That's part of why I talk about it. All right. So now we have what's called a pivot table. Uh, does anybody ever, does anybody know what a pivot table is? Raise your hand if you've ever heard of a pivot table. How about if you've ever heard of a pivot table? All right, now keep your hand raised if you know what a pivot table is, does, because those are often not the same set of people. All right, so pivot tables are in the data science world, um, really uh, 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 almost like a presentation, right? It's almost like a visualization um, where you want to simplify how something looks. Um, and go down here. So if we look at this table, that's why it says look up very conveniently. This is kind of hard to read, right? So it might be easier to read if we kind of rotated the table, right? And so what we can do with a pivot table is do exactly that. A pivot table will kind of like, the best I can describe it is rotate the data set so that it's easier to read. So if we go, sorry. Here, we basically pass in the same parameters oops, as we did for um, our multiple groups. So we're going to say sleep side. And the order of them is based on how I want it to be laid out. So you'll see in a second. So because there's only two options in handedness, that's kind of what I want to go down the left side because it'll make it shorter and easier to read. Um, and sleep side has more. So that's why I want it to go kind of this way because it'll be easier to read. I could do it the other way. It's just, this is simpler to understand. But as you can see, right, this is a lot easier to compare the, the, the like and like to each other. Does that make sense? So that's easier to read for most people than this is to easily say, and you even saw me struggling a little bit trying to figure out which right-handed uh, sleeping side was the highest, right? Um, whereas here, it's much more obvious, at least I think it is. Um, and most people would agree. And that's why you use a pivot table. It's, it's really almost more of a visualization than it is a, a real like statistical technique, okay? Because it's not really adding any value, right? Except for ease of understanding. Does that make sense? All right, so that in short is what a pivot table is. If you try to do a pivot table in Excel, 
It will involve significant amounts of drama, probably some crying, um, maybe, and a lot of Googling, okay? Uh, however, at the end of the day, this is really all it's trying to accomplish. Um, just trying to make it a, a easier to understand. And when you have, you know, your typical like Excel spreadsheet with, you know, 10,000 rows and 500 columns, it can be a big help. Um, but I find actually, it's funny, like Excel, Google Sheets, uh, even the open source uh, equivalent, which is LibreOffice. Um, I find all of them when you try to make a pivot table ridiculously confusing. So uh, if, if you also do, you're not alone. Um, I would much rather just do it like this. <laughs> but maybe that's because I'm a programmer first. Um, okay, so we can also um, do, this is where I uh, try to decide whether to do the slide first or the, or the uh, uh, code first. Um, okay, so we can also do some more features. So I'm gonna cut and paste this one. So apologies, it's a little long, um, but it's basically the top line. So I'll cut and paste that one down. And then we're gonna add in um, uh, like what it is we're actually looking for. So originally, right, in this one, it was just the count, right? So it's just 34 right-handed people sleep on their left side, okay? Instead, what I wanna do is I want, in this case, I want to know what the average number of taxis is for a left-handed left side sleeper, okay? So this is kind of like adding that extra argument to the group method, okay? Except you can kind of be even more elaborate. So what we're gonna get, right, is that right-handed left side sleepers um, uh, average about 10 taxis, right? People they text, so clearly, <laughs> Right-handed and left-handed, uh, you know, on left-side sleepers, average about the same number of people they text. Uh, whereas the right side is wildly different. Okay, I'm I'm very very curious if there's actually interesting data here, but I think it's kind of hilarious, right? Because all of you are in this data set, right? Um, so that's what you can do with the values and the collect function. So values is you know what is the value you want to operate on. And collect is, you know, what are you going to use to aggregate? Okay, what are you going to use? What technique are you going to take all those text E values and do to them before you display it? Okay, does that make sense? Okay, cool. Uh, let's see. And then, um, I don't know why I have this one. This is stupid. Uh, because it's the same thing again. I don't know why I put it in here. So ignore that one. Sometimes I have a brilliant idea of what I'm going to explain it and I forget what it is. All right, so pivot table. So the fancy term cross classifies according to two categorical variables, okay? And it produces a grid of counts or aggregated values. So aggregated just means grouped together, like put together using some technique, okay? So it might be the sum, it might be the average, it might be your own function, it might be whatever, okay? Um, and then it requires two arguments. You've gotta have a column A and a column B, okay? Um, and then it'll try to guess the values. Generally speaking, it's pretty good about that um, in that it'll just count the, basically what you get at the corner, right? So uh, if you, if you go here to here, right, it's going to count what falls in this cell. Okay. Um, but you can do something fancier if you want to by giving it either one of those, or I mean, that wouldn't make a whole lot of sense. You usually want to use some other column. Um, and then whatever function you want to use to bring, turn those values into a single value, right? Because you can't display multiple values in this box, it has to be just one. So you've got to aggregate them into one value somehow, okay? All right, so uh, I don't know if we'll do that demo, but whatever. So group or pivot, so a group, one combo of grouping variables per row, any number of grouping variables and aggregate values of all the columns in a table and the missing combinations are absent. 
Um, and so this part is one of the biggest differences between the two. You can't group by more than one thing in a pivot table. Or, sorry, more than two things, right? Um, there's always two. The values can be anything, but what is you know kind of going like this, right? Is always the same. Or is always two. Um, one combo of grouping variable for entry, and then uh, the aggregate values uh, of of some column, um, and then missing combinations will give you a zero or an empty string. So it depends on any given implementation. So just be aware of this, that this isn't necessarily like accurate, right? It just means there wasn't data there. Okay, so for example, what if we had no one who was left-handed and slept on the right side? Okay, so it's kind of zero, okay? It means we don't have data for that. So it's probably actually zero, but it's more likely that maybe we need a bigger data set. All right, so just whenever you see blanks, empty, you know, or even in the groups thing or zeros, you always want to look at it and kind of, you know, poke at it a little bit and make sure that you don't have a mistake. Because often that indicates that you mess something up. Okay, because zeros are weird. All right, any questions? Cool, because I want to get to the hardest thing in a minute. Or at least that I think most people find it the hardest, but it's not actually that hard. All right. So if the missing combos are absent, what does that mean you have a group or does that mean you have a pivot? All right, get those answers in. This one's a little bit of a trick question too. Not too bad. All right, closing. All right, so the difference here is a little bit subtle, right? An empty string and absent aren't quite the same, okay? So even though a pivot can have a zero or an, or an empty string in a particular position, in a group, when you do a group, it's literally just not there, okay? It is not attempted, it's just not there. So that's why I kind of asked the question because it's a little bit, you know, a nuanced answer. All right, another question. Um, I thought I deleted all the which tables, but uh, two grouping variables, only columns and rows. Is that what you see when you do, or is that what you're limited to with a group or limited to with a pivot? All right, closing. Okay, so this is why a group, the group function in a lot of ways is much more useful than the pivot, okay? Um, the group is very flexible. You can, you can do kind of as many groups as you want. Um, you know, this becomes really interesting when you have a lot of columns, like think of like the census data, you know, you want to group by gender and then you want to group by you know, like maybe zip code, and then maybe you want to group by, uh, I don't know, what other stuff there might be in the census off the top of my head. But you get the idea is that, um, you know, you, you kind of have a lot more flexibility. However, a pivot table is significantly easier to read. So often what you'll do is you'll kind of use a bunch of groups or whatever to kind of get at whatever it is you're trying to talk about or present or figure out, and then kind of result it somehow into a, some kind of pivot table so that you can drop that into the paper you're working on or whatever, um, so that it's easier to consume. Does that make sense? 
Okay. And sometimes I'll use a pivot in between because like I can't parse in my head what's going on because it's just too many, like too long, too diff, you know, too much going on at once. And so I'll kind of transform it to a pivot table just to kind of wrap my head around what's happening. All right. So moving on to joins. Okay. So first and foremost, a join is exactly what it sounds like. Okay. In that, imagine you have two spreadsheets, right? And you want to join them together because you have three columns over here and 17 columns over there, and there's some overlapping data. And so now you want to have uh, whatever, 20 columns all together. You just want to join the two sets together. But obviously, the data may not be sorted the same way, right? It may not even have one to one mapping. So, in other words, in my stupid example here, right? Um, not each place may have, let's see. Uh, so like there may not be, um, there's no kind of coupon. There's not four coupons, right? Even though there's four drinks. So in other words, we, when we join it, we have to join it based on some shared piece of data. Okay, so the coupon stuff, it doesn't matter that there's more of them. We, we can actually map them together by merging the two on some shared piece of data. And then we can, we'll manufacture some of the data, right? Because the coupon at Cafe Nero is always 10%. It doesn't matter what the drink is, okay? So even though it's now it's, it just makes two rows, or sorry, it really just populates this cell or this value twice, okay? Because they're just, it's not the same number of rows. Um, and then, but basically all it's doing is merging the two sets of columns, right? So it's making, you know, 25% at pavement and the milk tea at pavement and making this row, okay? Now, the way we articulate that when we program uh, this in Python, um, is we are gonna take the initial table. So often, like when I'm doing this, I think of this as like the root, okay? This is kind of like, or like the parent table, okay? And then I'm gonna join it using the values in this column, cafe, okay? Which is just the name of the column. Um, and then I'm gonna join it with the other table, the discounts table in this case, which I think of as the child or the subordinate table, okay? And then I'm going to use the values uh, in that column. Um, because like this column name and this column name don't have to be the same, right? They have the same data, but they, they don't have the same name. So they're, sorry, it's cafe here and location there. And the parent column name is the one that's going to win for the column name and the result. Okay, so that's why I kind of think of them as like one is the root, right? And the other one is the subordinate because the root one is the one that wins. That makes sense? Yes? Okay, yeah. Yeah, so everything in this table will appear in that one. And at usually everything in this and then some will appear in that table, okay? So any place where there's missing information, it's gonna fill it in. So like the 10%, for example, okay? Any other questions? I'll show a little demo of this because we have a little bit of time. All right. So, So we have this drinks table, okay, which we just saw. And we have our discount table, which we're gonna manufacture, okay? And so when we're trying to combine it, what do we do? We wanna take, like I said, what I consider the parent table or the root table, okay? And then we join it via the cafe column to the subordinate table, which is discounts, via the subordinate table's 
um, equivalent column. And if you get your quotes right, it'll work better. Oh, I still screwed it up. Oh, I forget. No, what? Oh, I missed the quote. Okay. And as promised, it does exactly what I showed in the slide. Um, so all I'm doing is kind of showing you how to think about it. You know, the, the parent is the first one, and then the subordinate one is the one you pass in as a parameter. <clears throat> Okay, and then we can also obviously um, uh, do things based on the joined table. Um, right? Oh, I did a second. So let's say I want to know what the discounted price is after the coupon. Okay, so the way we calculate that is we are going to subtract one minus combine column. Wait, it's, is it control space or tab on this? Control space. Um, coupon. Coupon is one of those words I cannot spell. Okay, and then divided by 100. Okay, so now I'm going to have an array of the um, discounts, right? And then I can add that, or sorry, the discounted price. And I can add that using with column to my table. So now my milk tea, my 25% off coupon on my $3.10 uh, milk tea um, will result in a $2.33 uh, drink, right? So now I can, you know, now it's just a table. Right now that I've joined it together, I found where what the linking data was, and I combined them into one table. And now I just have a table I can operate on just like any other table. Okay. So there's nothing magic about the result. It just becomes a table just like any other. Um, and so it's it, a join is super handy. In fact, it will be very handy on question 13 of the first section of the project. All right, let's see if I had. Oh, and then one other example we want to give is that your parent and child tables can be the same table. Okay, you don't have to, it doesn't have to be a different table. Um, the, the, the example I have is um, somewhat arbitrary, um, but there are often very good reasons for this that one of these days I'll come up with a good example for. Um, but so I can actually join the drinks table against itself, what do y'all think is going to be the result? Well, let's start here. How many columns will be in the resultant table? Do you think? How about right here in the middle? Five? Okay, what are they going to be? Right on. Um, obviously, second is far too much for the computer to type. So it's just too, but yes. Uh, so it still does the combination, right? So it still combines the columns that you said were the same. Um, and then it just repeats the data that you brought in. Okay. So this can be, this can be quite useful. Uh, I will think of a better example one of these days uh, for it, but that's what it's for. And then 